Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Ravi Majumdar, Emeritus Professor, Department of Natural Sciences in West Bengal University of Technology in Kolkata. Formerly, I was Professor and Head, Biophysics Division, Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics in Kolkata. Today, we are going to talk about wave particle duality, de Broglie waves, and the uncertainty principle. The name of the paper, as you know, is quantum biophysics. In the previous lecture, we have learned about Bohr's theory of hydrogen atom, or the Bohr model as it is called, and we could find, see how Bohr model could explain the discrete energy levels of an atom. And by extending Bohr's theory to elliptical orbits, we could also explain the shell structure of the atom. So, in the process, we could understand the hydrogen spectrum, for ex example, well, which was one of the big challenges to understand the hydrogen spectrum. And we could also uh, uh, find out the shell structure of an atom and explain what is known as the periodic table, which you all know. But we could not go beyond atoms on the basis of Bohr's theory. But our aim in biophysics is to study molecules. That is the basic aim of chemistry and biophysics, to study molecules. So we basically want, want to go from atom to molecule, and that is not possible on the basis of the Bohr model, which is called the old quantum theory. So for that, we have to go to what is known as the Schrodinger wave equation. And the Schrodinger wave equation is based on wave particle duality. So we'll talk about the wave particle duality and we'll talk about the Schrodinger equation. And then we shall see how, <coughs> you see, this helps us in understanding the energy stru level structure of, let us say, to start with the diatomic molecules like H2, O2, and things like that. So in a molecule, uh, well, we not only have the electronic energy levels, but we also have uh, the vibrational and rotational energy levels because the molecule is capable of vibrating and rotating, and these motions in quantum theory is also quantized. So we have to understand the electronic spectrum, vibrational spectrum, and the rotational spectrum of molecules, and then from diatomic molecules, we should go to uh, longer molecules because most of the bio biological molecules uh, which are basically important, they are, uh, you know, long chain molecules. So I think with this introduction, uh, uh, let me tell you, let me summarize see what we are going to learn or what are the objectives of this lecture. The objectives of this lecture are, uh, number one, to study the Planck's law of black body radiation and to emphasize that Planck's law of black body radiation is based on the particle nature of light. The second is that the electron also shows wave pattern. So it exhibits diffraction pattern showing that like light, it has a dual nature too. It can behave like a wave. Wavelength of an electron depends on its energy and is obtained from what is known as the de Broglie relation. And third, the de Broglie wavelength for electrons helps us to view Bohr orbits in atoms as a system of standing electron waves. The fourth, we talk about the application. So electron microscope is a practical application of the wave nature of the electrons. Its resolving power is enhanced considerably by using high energy electrons which have shorter wavelengths. And finally, we'll talk about the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and what are uh, the consequences of this uncertainty principle. So having discussed the objectives uh, of this lecture, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, these topics one by one and uh, describe the details of these topics. But before that, uh, let me show you some uh, the pictures of some uh, very important scientists who were behind uh, the development of modern quantum theory. The first of the f these photographs shows the picture of Niels Bohr who was uh, behind the development of the old quantum theory, that is the Bohr model, as you already know. And then I told you about Planck's law of black body radiation. You can see the photograph of Max Planck, who was also one of the pioneers in the development of modern quantum theory. In fact, 
modern quantum theory started from Planck's law of uh, black body radiation. And then you can also see the picture of Professor S. N. Bose, who had derived Planck's law on the basis of particle nature of light. Well, he assumed that light is basically an assembly of particles which are known as photons. And on the basis of this particle picture, he could derive Planck's law of uh, black body radiation. And this was a starting point of quantum statistics and which is very important in recent years. And then there's the picture of uh, De Broglie, whose name also I mentioned in the objectives. So De Broglie is the person who first pointed out that an electron has wave property. So he could find a formula uh, for the wavelength of electrons if the energy of the electron is known. And then comes the picture of Schrodinger and the modern quantum theory is based on Schrodinger equation, which actually we'll learn in the next lecture. And then we have the picture of Heisenberg. I talk, told you about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which we will discuss at the end of this lecture. So these are the very important personalities who are behind the development of modern quantum theory. Now, the first item, that what are the particles of light? Well, the particles of light are actually photons. The examples are photoelectric effect, and then Compton effect, and the third is black body radiation about which we have mentioned. Now, all these phenomena can be explained by assuming that light consists of particles or photons. Now, we will mainly talk about the black body radiation since this is uh, considered to be the starting point of modern quantum theory. Now, what is a black body? Now, black body is ideally an object which absorbs light of all wavelengths falling on it and so appears black when it is cold. A human body can be treated approximately as a black body. It emits mostly infrared radiation at room temperature. And similarly, sun is also a black body as we shall see and it emits light in the visible region. So next we come to the graphical representation of uh, Planck's law. That is the intensity of radiation on one side and the wavelength on the other side. So we can clearly see that the curve which corresponds to 5000 degree Kelvin, uh, well, that emits radiation in the visible region. And this is exactly the temperature of the outer surface of the sun. So we find that sun emits visible light, well, that's because the outer surface is, uh, the temperature is around 5,000. The inner surface, the temperature is more, and then the peak shifts towards the ultraviolet region. So then in the next slide, we can see the Planck's formula. U as a function of lambda t is actually a measure of the intensity of emission for different wavelengths at a given temperature. Well, this formula could not be explained on the basis of classical theory and the Planck's formula was really, it was empirical. So nobody knew how to derive Planck's formula. And uh, as I said already, that it was Bose, S. N. Bose, who later derived Planck's formula on the basis of the particle nature of light. Now, how to find out the wavelength for peak radiation intensity for black body radiation? So what we do is, in order to find out the wavelength for maximum intensity at a given temperature, we have to sort of differentiate this uh, and equate this to zero. And this gives lam lambda maximum, which is known as Wien's law. Lambda maximum equal to 2.9 into 10 to the power 6 divided by the absolute temperature and so many nanometers. So we can check that for a human body, where the temperature is around 300, uh, the radiation wavelength is peaked at 9,000 nanometer, which is in the infrared region, as I mentioned. Whereas for the sun, as I mentioned, that emission is peaked in the visible region. That is about 400 to 700 nanometers. So that's how, why we get white light from sun. And conversely, uh, the temperatures of surface of interior of sun or any other star can be estimated by noting the intensity of visible or ultraviolet wavelengths which are emitted by these objects. So you can realize is how important is this Planck's law of black body radiation. Now, what is the relation between the energy and the wavelength of a photon? It is known that the energy of a photon E is equal to H nu or which can be written as H cross omega because H by two pi 
and omega is 2 pi times nu. So it can be written either like uh, h nu or as h cross omega or conversely you have lambda equal to hc by e. So this is the energy wavelength relation for a photon. If you know what is the energy of a photon, you can find out what is the corresponding wavelength of light or vice versa. So there is an example uh, which uh, says find the energy of an X-ray photon having wavelength of 1 nanometer. So you calculate the energy which is Hc by lambda according to the formula uh, which is shown here. And so if you calculate this, then the result is 1.25 kilo electron volt. Well, I have already told you in the previous lecture that the energy is always measured in electron volts. So, after talking about the wave particle duality of photon, let us start with wave nature of electron. Now, like photon, electron or any other particle of mass m also exhibits wave character. Now, this feature is important for describing electrons in atoms and molecules as well as for designing electron microscopes. Now, according to Louis de Broglie, the French physicist, the wavelength of an electron having momentum p is lambda equal to h by p. This is a very important formula. And if you use the energy momentum relation, which we also used in the previous lecture, e equal to half mv square plus v or p square by 2m plus v, if you use this, then you can translate the momentum into energy and obtain the wavelength, which is equal to h divided by uh, under root 2m times e minus v and if you have free electrons then the potential is zero which gives lambda equal to h by root of 2m e. This lambda is called the de Broglie wavelength and gives energy wavelength relation for an electron. So note that lambda varies inversely as square root of e. In the case of photon it varies inversely as the energy but here it varies inversely as the square root of energy. Well, of course, people were really in doubt whether the electron really exhibits uh, wave nature. So the two physicists, Davison and Germer, who got Nobel Prize, see, for showing uh, that electrons can also have a diffraction pattern. Well, they designed an experiment to show that electrons like light waves can exhibit diffraction pattern when passed through certain crystals like nickel. So there is an example, find the Broglie wavelength of a 10 keV electron. So you can use the formula which we have already learned, lambda equal to h divided by root of 2 me. And if you calculate the wavelength, well, you have to change the electron volts into uh, joules if you are doing the calculation in MKS units. And the result has to be given either in nanometers or in angstrom. The result is uh, 0.012 nanometer or it's about 0.12 angstrom unit which is less than the size of a hydrogen atom. Next we talk about the electron microscope now, which is a practical application of uh, electrons wave nature. So you can see the basic uh, facts, the points in the screen. The resolving power, what is the use of designing an electron microscope? Because we know that in the case of uh, a microscope, the resolving power is inversely proportional to uh, the wavelength of the light used. Uh, but visible light has a very limited uh, wavelength range. So if you ease electrons, you can increase the energy of the electrons so that according to de Broglie relation, the wavelength becomes very small and that will make very high resolving power. Uh, on the screen, you can see that uh, the schematic diagram of a uh, electron microscope, which is called TEM, that is the transmission electron microscope. You have a filament and then which emits electron and these electrons, just as in the case of light, you have lens to focus the light. In the case of electrons, you use magnetic fields, uh, you know, because the electrons are charged particles which bend uh, in the presence of magnetic field. So you use a magnetic lens. So one condenser lens and the other is uh, magnifying lens and you have the specimen and finally uh, in the fluorescent screen you find the magnified image and then this image which is called the micro, my electron micrograph it is processed and then in the textbooks you can these days see the figures 
the various diagrams of um, you know living cell and all that those are based on the basis of electron micrograph for instance in the screen you can now see the TEM the electron microscopic image of a polio virus and the size of these virus is only 30 nanometer well it's not possible to have this kind of resolution or magnification with the help of uh, a usual electron microscope and the next figure is that of an animal cell there's a schematic diagram of an animal cell and shows the various parts the nucleus uh, uh, of the cell which contains dna and the outer parts of the shell where protein is synthesized the ribosomes and things like that and then we come to the wave nature of electron now according to bohr's postulate uh, we know that uh, the angular momentum is an integral multiple of h by 2 pi now if you use de broglie relation a lambda equal to h by p to eliminate the momentum then we get 2 pi r equal to n lambda so this gives the picture of an allowed orbit in terms of standing waves because 2 pi r equal to n lambda means that this that only those orbits in an atom are allowed where the circumference is an integral multiple of lambda the wavelength of the electron in that orbit so that you get standing waves if this condition is not satisfied then you wouldn't get a standing wave there would be destructive interference but in the light of wave particle duality we can now figure out that only those uh, orbits are allowed you see where standing wave pattern can be formed so we can look upon the atomic orbits as a system of standing electron waves so this is a very important thing to note okay then we have talked about the thermal neutrons and free electron gas what is thermal neutron thermal neutrons is usually a neutron gas at uh, room temperature so you know that e equal to 3 by 2 kt that is the energy of thermal neutrons so if you put this into the de broglie relation the expression for energy then you get lambda equal to h by root of 3 mkt so from this we find that uh, the thermal neutrons at have a wavelength at uh, at normal temperatures has wavelength of 0 0.15 nanometer or 1.5 uh, angstrom unit but if it were free electrons instead of uh, you know thermal neutrons well actually why are these free, free electrons important because you have free electrons in metals those are the valence electrons which are regarded as a free electron gas in metals and if you calculate the same for the free electrons then the result you get is 6 nanometer which is 60 angstrom which is much longer than the wavelength of the neutrons and that is why we have an, an indistinguishable uh, system of electron gas inside a metal. So then finally we come to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So what is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Well the question is can you see an electron? Well if you come to a particle like electron well in order to see it you have to disturb it because you see you have to see it with help of light so whenever you sort of shine an electron with light then the photons the very photons they disturb the position of the electron so you are never able to pinpoint the electron uh, so this is an inherent uh, you know property of nature that you can never pinpoint a small particle like an electron because the very act of observation will disturb it well to an extent let us say delta x well if you are considering an electron is free to move only along the x-axis then the uncertainty in electrons position in del is delta x and when you have this uncertainty in its position then it also involves a corresponding uncertainty in its momentum because the electron can sort of move around uh, you see within this uncertainty cloud as you can call it and so you will have an uncertainty delta p and so the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that the product of these two uncertainties is always of the order of h, the Planck's constant, h cross. Uh, now, since uh, on the in the view of uh, de Broglie relation, lambda equal to h by p suggests that uh, a spread in momentum also implies a spread in spread in the wavelength of the electron. So basically, the electron 
is should be represented by a group of waves which is uh, called a wave packet and we'll uh, come to this uh, question in the next next lecture but here finally we um, talk about a thought experiment that is how do we come to uncertainty principle now if you are say looking at the electron with the help of uh, let's say light of wavelength lambda then you see we can assume that there is an uncertainty delta x which is of the order of lambda and the incident photon it has a momentum which is e by c or h nu by c or h by lambda so it can at best transfer the entire momentum to the target electron during the bombardment so the maximum uncertainty in electrons momentum delta p turns out to be h by lambda so the product of delta x and delta p from these equations turns out to be of the order of h the Planck's constant so finally you see you can obtain hydrogen ground state energy from uncertainty principle question is that what is the minimum size of a hydrogen atom the minimum size of a hydrogen atom is its first orbit and let us assume that the uncertainty is equal to the radius of the first orbit which is known as Bohr orbit A. So we take delta x of the order of A and then by uncertainty principle since delta x delta p is of the order of h cross so the momentum is given by h by 2 pi A. So this is the de Broglie relation uh, well for a ground state uh, electron which can be written as h by lambda. So the total energy now E is equal to p square by 2 m plus v. So if you put the value of p is equal to h by 2 pi a then you can see on the screen what you get and for the lowest energy you have to differentiate this <coughs> with respect to a because our aim is to find out the optimum value of a so if you differentiate this with respect to a it gives a equal to h cross by k m e square which is the Bohr radius so this is a very important sort of consequence of the uncertainty principle which we, which we know is true. Once you find the, uh, the Bohr radius, you can put it back in the expression for energy and the result is the, uh, the ground state energy of the hydrogen atom which agrees completely with the result obtained from Bohr's theory. So the un uncertainty principle serves as a guideline to understand many other phenomena on the atomic scale. A related form of the uncertainty principle involves energy and time instead of position and momentum and can be expressed as delta E delta T of the order of H cross. This relation tells us that the energy violation delta E in a given system may be allowed only for the time delta T equal to H cross delta E. So larger energy violations are allowed for much shorter time only. Time energy uncertainty relation is applied successfully in estimating the range of nuclear forces and this uh, relation is also useful in predicting spectral line weights. Now let's come to the first of these applications that is the range of nuclear forces. Protons and neutrons, well they are called nucleons. When I say nucleon, it means either proton or a neutron. So protons and neutrons are glued together inside a tiny atomic nucleus of dimension of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 meter. And this is known as one Fermi. That's the typical uh, dimension of a nucleus, atomic nucleus. So in this short range, much stronger nuclear force takes over so that even Coulomb repulsion between protons cannot destabilize the nucleus. This is point number one. And the point number two is that the strong nuclear force with such short range of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 meter or one Fermi is looked upon as a result of continuous interplay between any two nucleons by a virtual pi meson which acts like an invisible tennis ball having mass 2.5 times 10 to the power minus 28 kg which means a rest energy E equal to mc square equal to 2.24 times 10 to the power minus uh, 11 joule and if you change it to electron volts it turns out to be 140 million electron volts so this is the rest energy of a pi meson 
which is exchanged between uh, <clears throat> the protons in the nucleus. Okay, so you are familiar with this formula E equal to mc squared because this is the famous Einstein formula. So when the first, supposing we are considering two nucleons, so when first of these nucleons at rest emits a pi meson, it violates energy by an amount uh, which is equal to the mass, rest mass of the pi meson, that is delta E equal to mc squared by time energy uncertainty relation. So this energy violation delta E is permitted only for a time delta T equal to H cross by delta E, right, by the uncertainty relation. So within this time, the pi meson uh, must be absorbed by the second nucleon. This process con continues as long as the two nucleons are within a range R equal to C times delta T, since at best the virtual particle, that is the pi meson, uh, can move with a speed close to that of light. So the range becomes C times the delta T, that is the time for which the energy violation is per per delta E is permissible according to uncertainty relation. So R, the range is C, the speed of light, times delta T, uh, which is equal to uh, H cross C by delta E, according to uncertainty principle. And this turns out to be, you put the value of H cross, which is 10 to the power minus 34, times the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters. And in the denominator, this is the uh, rest energy of the pi meson in joules. Uh, so this is of the order of, this should be of the order of 10 to the power minus uh, 15 meters, which is the nuclear dimension. So putting delta E equal to mc square, where m is the mass of the particle exchange, that is the pi meson, we get the formula R equal to h cross c by delta E equal to h cross by mc. So this shows that the range is larger for lighter particle exchanged. So Coulomb force has an infinite range according to this relation. Well, the Coulomb law doesn't have a cutoff value like the nuclear force. Well, it has a long range, it can be considered to have inf infinite range as the particle exchange are photons instead of pi mesons in the case of nuclear force. And the photons have zero rest mass and that is why the Coulomb uh, force is a long range force uh, with practically of no cutoff value, okay? It can be considered to be of infinite range. As compared to the nu uh, range in the nuclear uh, force, well, which is of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 meters because that is medi mediated by pi mesons, well, which are, uh, which, which, uh, which is a massive particle. So this shows the picture of proton and neutron. So they are, they are uh, sort of constantly exchanging pi mesons, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, so that is how the two nucleons uh, are glued together. It's because of the exchange of pi mesons. So they are continuously exchanging pi mesons, okay? And uh, so this process continues. Well, this is just like, you know, two tennis players and a tennis ball, which is a pi meson, that's an invisible tennis ball that keeps on, keeps on getting exchanged between the two players. And uh, that is how the two players, in this case the two nucleons, uh, have a binding force between them. So uh, we call it a virtual pi meson because you really cannot see these pi mesons. Uh, well, these are absorbed within a very short time. And the next important application is the lifetime for excited state of atom for spectral line width. Now the atom spends only a limited time in its excited state before it finally falls back into the ground state. The decay of an excited state is a statistical process and the mean time for decay is called the lifetime of an excited state. Well, I think you already know this. The time energy uncertainty relation is very useful to estimate the lifetime of an excited state by measuring spectral line width for the corresponding transition. Wider spectral line means shorter lifetime. Now, if you just consider a typical spectrum, uh, the lifetime, which is denoted by tau, usually of the order of 10 to the power minus eight seconds, is a measure of the time available to determine the energy of the excited state. So applying the time energy uncertainty relation, delta E, delta T of the order of 
H cross, we get delta E, equal, which is uh, being called gamma, that's equal to H cross by delta T, and delta T is equal to tau, so H cross by tau. The energy width delta E equal to gamma is called the natural line width of an excited state. So knowing delta E, the width of, the actual width of a spectral line in terms of delta lambda can be determined by using the relation H C by lambda. We shall see this uh, in the example that uh, follows. So now let's come to the example. The width of a spectral line of wavelength uh, lambda equal to 4000 angstrom for an atom. Well, it could be one of the lines in the hydrogen spectrum, for ex example. So this uh, spectral line of wavelength lambda equal to 4000 angstrom is found to be uh, you see, 1.2 times 10 to the power minus 4 uh, angstrom. So this is the measured value of uh, the line width delta lambda. So now the question is that use uncertainty relation to obtain the lifetime of the corresponding excited state. And the question, does the lifetime depend on Planck's constant? The solution, what you have to do, you have to use the time energy uncertainty relation delta E, delta T of the order of H cross. So from this you get tau is equal to H cross by delta E or H by 2 pi uh, gamma, well h cross is equal to h by 2 pi, so that's how you get this. Now if you differentiate this, uh, the relation h equal to hc by lambda with respect to lambda, you get delta e, the magnitude of it, which you have defined as gamma, equal to hc by lambda squared times delta lambda. So combining these equations and expressing wavelengths in meters, you get the value of tau that is uh, the lifetime of the excited state, and it turns out to be about seven times 10 to the power minus uh, nine second. Well, as I told you in the beginning, that these lifetimes are usually of the order of 10 to the power minus eight uh, uh, seconds, a little more, a little less. So this is exactly uh, the result which you are getting for in this particular case. Um, and the second part of the uh, question is that, is, is the lifetime dependent on uh, Planck's uh, uh, constant? The answer is no, because you don't have Planck's constant in the expression for the lifetime tau. So the lifetime is independent of the Planck's constant. Students, we have now come to the end of the lecture. So before we end up, let us summarize what we have learned from this lecture. Number one, Planck's law marks the beginning of quantum mechanics. It is based on particle nature of light. Number two, electron can behave like waves as shown by its diffraction pattern. Number three, de Broglie wavelength for electrons helps us to view the Bohr orbits as standing electron waves. Number four, the electron microscope is a useful practical application of the wave nature of electrons. Resolving power of the microscope can be increased drastically by using high energy electrons having much shorter wavelengths. And finally, we have learned about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and its implications. Thank you.